for joining the uh, January 24th meeting of the Northampton Planning Board. Uh, we always begin our public hearing uh, asking for comment from the public on any item that is not on our agenda. Um, we do have a hearing item starting at 7.30, but if anyone would like to make a comment on any item that is not on our agenda, please come to the podium and tell us your name and your address. <laughs> Just here to observe. <laughs> Uh, so we do have a couple of administrative things. I think Wayne, you're going to start us off on the resilience. Um, is that what we're starting with? Um, yeah, we can start with that. So we have just um, planning um, and resiliency plan information um, and sort of a uh, roadmap for where we were going in the next several months. And then we have an a and R. Um, and that's about it. Did I send you minutes? minutes. Uh, we don't have minutes, I no. So, yeah, so we can start with this. Great. Great. Okay. Floor is yours. So, again, I hope to get discussion going. So, at the last meeting, I said we, we went over, you know, sort of where we're going with the planning process. And I said we'd come back based on the discussion and talk about how we <coughs> need to start communities and what that meant. And there's Carolyn said we're going to go on to talk about sort of upcoming attractions that you guys are going to deal with. Um, so fairly quick. So just, just quickly, the reason we did STAR in the first place, this is now six years ago, is we know that lots of communities do sort of greenwashing. Right? I, I, I read this article once when I was in the dentist office. I don't usually read yachting magazines about this new really cool yacht that got two miles to the gallon crossing the Atlantic. And they were arguing it was sustainable because the one it replaced got, you know, one mile to the gallon. Um, but I'm not really sure that's like really sustainable. <laughs> and so we went through this process of saying, we, you know, we need to decide what kind of community we want. And so most of our planning process is, what are we trying to get? What do we want to be when we grow up? And how are we achieving that? But if we're talking about things like greenhouse gas emissions and becoming a more resilient city, we'd like comparing to other places so that it makes some sense. So we used STAR communities six years ago. STAR is going to, runs out the end of this year. We thought about renewing STAR for the next five years, but we decided it didn't really make sense to renew something that's not going to be sort of accepted in the marketplace. So we're going to switch to lead for cities. Um, it's frankly, I don't think it's quite as good because it's not as co quite as comprehensive, but it's less work for us and it's some benefit and it's more recognizable. So STAR. You, excuse me, when you say five stars not accepted or not, is it just not recognized so, to the level? Yeah, it's a lot of work to get a star communities. And mm -hmm. so in the end, in the six years it was in existence, only 75 communities signed up for it. Now it's 20% of the population because <coughs> they're big communities. Yeah. But they, they wanted to get more, you know, like lead for buildings clearly has acceptance in the marketplace. Right. Star had acceptance for people like me who follow this stuff, but it was, didn't necessarily have name recognition. Um, right. Whereas LEED does. A STAR merged with, with U.S. Green Building Council. U.S. Green Bin Building Council had this product. They were testing STAR for cities, and so they put the two of them together. Okay. Um, so we're automatically not doing any work, a LEED for cities silver community because we were STAR and STAR came in. So we're going to be going through this. I think we've decided, we sort of had three decisions. Do we stick with STAR? Do we go for lead during beta testing, which is the next three months, or do we wait till the final lead comes out in May? And I think we're waiting for the final lead to come out in May. So you're gonna see this you know, in May when the final stuff's out, we'll come back and talk to you. I just wanted to go back and sort of remind us of where we were six years ago, because you know, the, 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 we think from STAR and from your comprehensive plan that these are part of our mission we've been trying to follow. And so it's, it's nice when you don't have a meeting full of, I mean, a room right. full of people, you don't have a really full agenda, just sort of think, you know, why are we here? Why are you guys all giving up <laughs> lots of your free time? So, you know, I just want to start with this slide. I, I like the slide, so I use it a lot, but about the time we were going through star communities, Taco Bell said, we think Northampton has a, a green reputation, so we want Northampton to be the first gold Taco Bell in the country. And you guys actually helped a little bit. You waived part of the traffic mitigation fees <coughs> in order to help them along. And, and there's no question that the Taco Bell is a greener building than the McDonald's next door. 
But there's also no question that when that building is tired in 40 years, they're going to tear it down and start over again. And so I like the slide because it's the same year that that old Pratt house was moved for. I, I know I just heard you say how moving a house yeah, yeah. makes sense economically, but the house moved and it had a statement that this house that's 120 years old, 140 years old, whatever it is, is probably more durable and probably has a better green footprint than Taco Bell, even though it's not lead gold, it just, you know, it's a durable building. And so that was, again, part of why we thought about what does it mean to be green, you know, what does it mean to have all these things, and it's a reminder. And that comment in the bottom about the community conversation, I, I'm convinced the more I do work in other towns, that for all you can score things on, on lots of different measures, the communities that are most sustainable are the communities where that's just part of the community conversation. Right? So no matter how good leadership, no matter how much things happen in the background, if you don't have a community conversation, it, it doesn't go anywhere. We, we got a survey, just as an example of this, there was a survey done for Valley Bike um, on how successful it's been. We've, it's been in five communities. They, they gave the results today. And we were amused to see that, as many of these things are, of the survey, the 350 survey respondents, 50% of them were from Northampton, and 50% were from the other four towns uh, who are in the community. And I think it's that engagement is why we get to do lots of things. And so it's a, it's a really important part of these things. Um, so just quickly, this is a hard slide to read, but so STAR rated us in these different things, these different categories, um, built environment, equity, um, and we did really well. The way I tend to describe it is, we get an A minus. We did really well, and it helped us <coughs> out. So we were the first five-star communities that only a total of four. When Cambridge came along, and so you're only supposed to quote what, what, what level star you are, you three, four, or five. Cambridge came along, and they got more points than we did. So they weren't satisfied to say they're a five-star community. They had to say, we're a five-star community. We have more points than Northampton. <laughs> but I sort of liked it, like you know, Cambridge comparing themselves to Northampton, that, that's OK. Um, <laughs> So we did well. If you notice in social equity, um, we did the worst score in social equity, but the reality is everybody got the worst score in social equity. Um, you, know, we, you know, it's hard if you're low income to find housing. It's hard to get equal opportunities. So we actually did, did really well in all the categories. Um, some, we're always really honest, we, didn't, we did better in STAR than we're doing LEED, in part because STAR gave points for er things that only urban areas could do things that only suburban areas can do and things that only rural areas can do. And we're really all of those things. So, you know, Cambridge couldn't get points for preserving 25% of the city's open space and suburbs can't get points for having four homeless shelters, all of which we do. So, um, so we do well. And then we just have like four or five slides just to give examples of what does this mean. So, you know, the, the premise for sustainability is you can't be sustainable unless you have a town center. Like, even if you, if you have, LEED certified platinum buildings that have low energy footprint and net zero and everyone drives everywhere and you know people who can't afford to drive aren't included you're not really going to be sustainable and so a lot of the, the rating is how how vibrant is your downtown how much activities how walkable is it how much affordable housing is it are you trying to focus mostly affordable housing within walking distances and so we did really well i think they want you to have um 10 percent of the housing downtown be affordable and this one, it was within, because these years move, the numbers go up and down, but within three years, you know, how much affordable housing have you gotten? And six <clears throat> years ago, we had 23% of the new housing in downtown was affordable. Obviously, this year and next year, with the two big projects on Pleasant Street, our numbers will be really high. Other years, it's lower. Um, but so we do well there. We may be losing a little ground with PBTA cutbacks. Um, you guys are less involved with this, but as a city, we obviously care about unemployment rates and, and median incomes. You probably know that we have consistently among the lowest unemployment rates in the Commonwealth, but we have relatively low median income. So we have colleges that have a stable workforce, but we never, we never either boom or bust in the process. But, so we try to work on these things. Greenhouse, so these are old numbers because we've been doing a lot of work on this, but greenhouse gas emissions, six years ago our target <coughs> was to get to an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions <coughs> by 2050. Our target's now being 100% carbon neutral by 2050. Um, but we're making progress, and so this is where some of the work you're seeing going forward. We come to you and talk about how do we encourage more net energy, <coughs> net, net zero energy buildings 
it, you know, you're seeing pieces of this, this overall piece for how do we get there. So we're doing fairly well in this process. Um, green infrastructure, this is really more the area of Conservation Commission in terms of buying open space. Um, when we did this six years ago, we were about halfway to our target of open space. Uh, we've now achieved that target. Um, but you see some of these projects in terms of zoning regulations that encourage open space, limited development projects that we do, um, certainly green infrastructure projects in terms of stormwater. Um, and so we do really, this is one of the areas we do really well in. Um, and then sort of downtown, obviously a lot of the big debate going on has been about infill, and I never actually liked the term infill. Um, but, you know, so we talk about right-sizing where, where development occurs. And this chart, the blue, is where our housing starts compared to where we want them to be. So the blue was sort of our success stories. The brown was less success. So the blue was basically housing in downtown Florence, more or less within a mile of those areas, at the state hospital, and cluster developments, cluster developments even in suburban areas. And so we did really well in this process. Um, it's important to remember in this, in this whole, the reason I don't like infill is we've been really successful at getting a huge percentage of housing starts than walking distance to downtown, but our population size, the number of people per dwelling unit is dropping so fast that even though for 30 years we've had a lot of new units within walking distance to downtown, we actually have fewer people living now within walking distance to downtown than we did 30 years ago. So that's, <coughs> that's in some ways why the pressure on us for infill continues if we want to have a vibrant downtown. You know, once you get in your car, if you live in the western part of the city, you get in your car, you're probably more likely to eat in East Hampton than North Hampton, and once you get in a car, you don't care where you go. The people who walk downtown are the ones who spend the money there and support it, and so that's gonna to continue to be a piece. Walkability comes both from the, you know, who lives downtown again, it's walkable, but also how are we adding sidewalks, are we adding bike lanes, are we doing all those things. So we've been, we were successful six years ago, and I think, we probably even been more successful in the last six years in these areas. So you, you see more of these coming back forward. Um, so then the, the next thing we're going to talk about, and most of this will be Carolyn, but we just want to, you know, obviously we keep working on improving the process. So the thing on the left is basically just to remind you of all the things that we've done in the last decade. Um, and most of you had, George was probably involved with some of these things, but I just want to take you back down memory lane, and to, again, to remind you of why we're here. So it used to be during building boom periods, you know, when there wasn't a recession, the planning board would routinely meet until midnight. Um, and we've done a lot, and, and continue hearings, and it was really a really brutal process for the planning board members, for applicants, for the public. And <laughs> I know. on the midnight <laughs> 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 So we did two big, I mean, we've done three big things. One, frankly, is we've been successful at moving development <coughs> from out in suburban areas to more urban areas. And so that means subdivisions that are excruciating have all but disappeared. And so that's one reason you have less time. The subdivisions could be, you know, several hours per project. The second is we had an enormous over, this is one of the first things we did <coughs> 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, but we had an enormous overlap between the zoning board and the planning board. It was sort of random, right? So 1974, almost everything went before the zoning board. And then we had site plan approval started in 19, early 80s. And that came to the planning board, but then the special permits were really just divided, right? If it had required a special permit in 74, it stuck with the zoning board. If we added a new zoning special permit, it came to the planning board and didn't make a lot of sense. You spent a lot of time reviewing things that went to the zoning board and making recommendations. So we sort of rationalized it. We said, if it requires a site plan, the special permit that's associated should come to you all. If it doesn't require a site plan, since the zoning board has time, they should do things like home occupation, which used to require more special permits, <coughs> signage, um, and those sort of things. Um, and it's really cut back their workload even more dramatically than yours, but your workload as well. Um, so that was the first thing we did, i say 15 or 20 years ago. And then more recently, probably on George's first term on here, we looked at the permits in detail that you were approving and which permits we almost always approving. And those, we moved many of them from special permits to site plan approvals. So um, accessory apartments um, where it wasn't visible from the street used to require a special permit. That's now either by right or by site plan, depending mm -hmm. on what we're doing. Um, and so there's a few things like, I mean, a lot of those things we moved over in the categories. Um, 
we shorten the approval process. So you all see this, you know, Carolyn's job is the, the tough love approach. So her job is to be really tough at vetting applications <coughs> um, and not letting them on your agenda until is a chance it could be acted on one night. And then when it could be acted on one night, we hope that most of them are not. Obviously, there's some really complex projects. It's going to be one, two, three hearings. But those should be exceptions rather than, than the norm. Um, and then obviously you typically act on the permit the same night that, that you hear it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's helped. We, we had a problem. There was a Gazette expose 15 years ago on how the planning board was horrible at reaching quorums. Um, and it wasn't actually you had a problem reaching quorums. It was if you had five people on a special permit and you closed the public hearing and then two weeks later you went to vote on it and you had five people again, you had a quorum, but not the same people. Right you couldn't act and so moving on one night was, it was a big process and um and we actually become i'm sure developers always complain to you but our process is probably faster than most communities around here in the process um so that's sort of where we are now um we've done a couple other things playing in terms of the streamlining process we have two areas where planning staff can issue permits and there are things that are basically this not discretion right so someone comes in one's about signs what was the other one um, there was some driveway, side lot line access, and also s um, a limited number of solar uh, voltaic um, installations. And they're not, it hasn't really made a big difference in workload because there's not many of those things. I don't know, one a year, you know, if that. Um, but it's sort of symbolic. It's saying, you know, if nothing else, selling city council on there are some staff permits that are acceptable, the things that you know, we want you all because you're you represent the community and you have a difference of opinion, and so following the law, you can still disagree, and that's basically the line. If reasonable people come up with r different answers following the same law, then that should go before a citizen committee. If five people reading the same thing should always come up with exactly the same outcome, then that's the stuff that makes sense for. It. <clears throat> so we've done some of that. It was really more experimenting; didn't come to much. And then a lot of zoning reform. Again, some of you have been involved, some aren't. The, the URC, URB, the densification of those to a lesser extent, densification URA, increasing height limits and getting rid of the last the dimensional requirements on central business district, allowing housing above the first floor and office industrial. Um, actually changing the name of office industrial from special industrial to office industrial to represent what's there. So those have all been sort of what we've been moving on. And so we think these should be the workload going forward as, as we try to prioritize things, but obviously you all have to make sure you're comfortable with it. So I'll just go through this quickly and Carolyn's going to take you in more detail, but ignore the, the detached accessory apartments, but just thinking about are there other opportunities to expand the administrative site plan for things that make sense for things where it's not a lot of discretion involved. Uh, and Carolyn's going to talk about the accessory apartments. Is that, is that one of them? Um, Sorry. It really wants to scan the computer. <laughs> Tell it to wait 10 hours. Of course. That's the most let's do. I think it's like always there because how come it's not like accepting it? Oh. I think you started the scan. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I swear I said no four oh, hours. <laughs> okay. Maybe you'll let me do that. So then, you know, we know that some of the zoning still doesn't make sense. Uh, and so we want to start thinking about those areas. The ones we're going to start talking about tonight are places where you have is, uh, a zoning district that's almost an island, right? You have dense development and suddenly it goes to a different zoning district because somebody in 1974 during the public hearing process said, we think we should have a different zoning or some, ra I mean, it's not always rational, so we're gonna talk about those. So think about sort of rationalize what the districts are. I mean, to me, the zoning should always tell a story that matches the comprehensive plan, right? Why do we have this district? And so we're gonna begin talking about tonight and then later on is what are the places we don't know why we have it that, that way? Um, and so those are the things we're going to start with now, but then going forward, keep continuing looking at URA. URA gaze, again, is this, it's not a clear logic where the URAs are, and so there's probably other places to look at. The net zero energy buildings, what are the incentives we can do for that? Last meeting, we talked about the form-based code downtown in Florence. That will be coming before you while <coughs> there. 
Um, and then our lighting, Carolyn, this is a problem staying somewhere too long. Carolyn rewrote the zoning code for the lighting a decade ago, and we were probably the state of the art, and then um, <coughs> LED lights came along, and our zoning doesn't really make sense. We have to come back and, and revisit those things, so. So Wayne, that first bullet, the administrative site plan, that's what you're talking about, how, what might be handled within the planning office? Mm -hmm. And those would cover detached accessory apartments? Well, that's, that's the conversation. The so I'm going to turn this over question. to Carol. Yeah, yeah. Take this okay. Part. All right. Because <laughs> you're going to stay here and just tell me what to do this? Um, yeah. I don't, does that work? Is that yeah, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you want to jump right in. I mean, the idea about um, creating more projects that would fall under administrative site plan is to, to sort of respond to people who have said, you know, it's, it's burdensome and onerous to go through the whole process, to come to the planning board, it costs money. So the smaller developers or the homeowners that might want to add one or two units have to do the same amount of work and expend almost the same amount of money. And so um, by creating sort of a, a different threshold of permitting for those projects that are probably a little bit simpler, um, <coughs> it makes sense and it would probably be a good conversation for you all to have but the idea the goal is to take some of those things that we could really um, specify exactly what those approval criteria are so that again we're not um, there's not really a discretionary permit right. that's being granted but it's all spelled out ahead of time in the zoning um, and um, you know, take them one step at a time. Don't go through the entire code and start making a bunch of changes, but try to incrementally add those um, permits that might make sense and break down some of those barriers to people who want to create one or two residential units. Um, so the idea, though, is to still have a clearly defined process where we would notify abutters. I mean, this is a concept we've um, come together internally just to think about what would be important for people in this transition not only for board members but also for residents who who abut these projects um, so create a procedural um, a, a very clear procedure for people in which we would still mail notice to mm -hmm. the abutters there would still be an opportunity for those abutters to come and sit with the staff as a evaluation of the um, project were being made and then a notice to the abutters that a decision at the staff level had been made um, and then create an appeal process that comes to the planning board so it wouldn't um, cut out uh, you know a secondary review process um, that is pretty low threshold you wouldn't have to go to court in order right. to appeal something like that so that's the kind of um, thinking that we've had internally about how we could do that um, and the, the first one of the initial um, permits that we've talked about um, uh, looking at is detached accessory apartments and the reason for that is um, to look at, and you can change this, I don't think I have anything on the next slide, but I'm sort of moving to the next slide, is that we've heard from the housing partnership that um, people have um, stated that accessory dwelling units, which again are by definition only part of a single family home, so it's adding one smaller unit to an existing single family home. Right now, attached units are allowed by right. Detached units have required a special permit for 20 plus years. Um, the zoning board has rarely turned those down. And as we move in the direction of trying to figure out how do we, not only how do we create more housing units, how do we remove some of those impediments, those are, so th those single family homeowners may want to try to do these things, but they're then having to go through a slightly more burdensome process than the folks that want to do an attached unit. We've also changed the zoning to allow uh, prince, second principal structures on um, properties by site plan anyway, site plan to the planning board. So that's even a lower threshold than the current special permit for detached accessory <coughs> dwellings. So the idea is to sort of test it out with these detached accessory dwellings mm -hmm. um, and but but keeping in the spirit of these being sort of um, really small projects that 
generally get approved um, and that we think we could define what approval would mean very easily you know buffers the parking has to be in a certain location on the parcel you still have to meet your setbacks all of mm -hmm. that's already defined so you just take out the um, interpretation and make it yeah yeah right um, and um, so you know this has sort of been it, um, partially on the punch list for the housing partnership for a long time um, but they've actually wanted to have um, any accessory dwelling units no matter where they're located on the property just be allowed some members anyway and what we think is there's still not community consensus to allow less than the standard setback um, which we don't now but so we're not pushing it further than what the rules would require now we're just um, we want to explore making it a staff approval um, just like attached units are staff approval essentially by the building department you, you mentioned there's not consensus just on this that one particular unit has there been a lot of actual formal debate on detached accessory units like where, where somebody wants to put her in-law apartment above the garage but it doesn't meet setbacks I mean has there been a lot of in a public setting has that really been discussed so when we went through, not specifically for accessory units, when we went through the zoning changes for A, B, and C in 2010, 11, yeah. 12, 13, right. um, there was a lot of discussion about setbacks and um, where, uh, and by allowing infill, um, there, it, it, there was concern that um, the new units would be um, taking up all that open space and Cha changing the character of the neighborhoods potentially too much unless mm -hmm. you kept you know sort of the standard side setbacks we did um, modify the side setbacks in the URC district because it just matched what's on the ground so it was 15 feet to the side lot lines mm -hmm. um, and now it's 10 feet because frankly there were a right. lot of nonconformities because they were mostly at 10 feet anyway but in B and A, they remained at 15 feet. We did change the front setback for both C and B to 10 feet from 20. Um, but that's different because you're at the street as opposed to abutting a neighbor. So, but on the other side, we've had people, I've had people call various times every year about wanting to convert their garage. Mm -hmm. And it's too close to the property line. So those individuals really want their own project but then those same individuals sometimes show up to public hearings right. fighting new units on other properties in their neighborhood. So, you know, I don't know if yeah. that, that's a clear indication of right. what the community wants. So it may be worthwhile to think about that. Um, but I think um, maybe the incremental step is to say, let's keep the setbacks the way they are, but reduce the burden for the permitting mm -hmm. part of it and then see what the next step is maybe we do allow those existing garages that are four feet from the lot line um, right. convert to residential space would the, sorry George would the uh, administrative site plan review give you an opportunity to also apply conditions or is it really just sort of like checklists you've done it like I think it would have to be checklist because yeah. conditions are sort of then become discretionary. Right. And so I guess the nature of my question is, also, is sort of like, are we like losing out on an opportunity to have to <coughs> use positive conditions if there are things that, you know, we're hoping to achieve? I, 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 think, we, I think we can do conditions that <coughs> have the back way door approach of turning something down. So if it's yeah. about requiring landscaping or fencing, I think we could do that in, in, as part of that. Right, but I, I guess I was thinking more that the zoning would say you need to have X type of buffer. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the condition is, well, in this location it needs to be a fence versus landscaping right. as opposed right. to, you know, yeah. turn your house around and. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I like the idea. I just wanna make yeah. sure that, that staff would have the same opportunity that we have to kind of. Yeah. And I think that would be sort of the trick in drafting the language is mm -hmm. what you all, um, you know, and you all could certainly, um, you know, we look 
for your input on that, what makes sense to write right in there. What's important when we're thinking about detached units that would be in a backyard of um, a single family homeowner's mm -hmm. property. <coughs> so um, the one, not concern, but the one observation I have is that what I hear is there's a lot of folks, especially downtown in the, around the whole infill concept, and I appreciate that you think it's the wrong term for it, but uh, there's a lot of kind of pushback on infill, mostly because I don't think people understand it. So when a new, when any kind of uh, dwelling is built or an expansion in a neighborhood or new, that seems to affect the character of the neighborhood, um, and that's very subjective, of course. People raise their hand that infill's bad. Here's another case of infill that we shouldn't allow. You know? yeah. um, and I know a couple of times that's happened with the attached dwelling units. You know, there's some really big examples around the city where, you know, it was a big unit that was attached to another unit and it surprised neighbors. Um, so infill gets used as the boogeyman by a lot of people, I think, mm -hmm. for very <laughs> appropriate kind of situations. So some way I'd love to have, if we're going down this route, um, and I'd love to have some kind of, oh, an opportunity for the public to hear about infill again, you know, and exactly what it is and what have been good examples of it and why we do it. Mm -hmm. And maybe that would be an opportunity to change kind of the name for it. Um, so, I, and I appreciate that in these situations where it might come through just staff review, that there's the same advisement notices to all the abutters, you know, so they have that opportunity. Because I've been surprised in my years in the board when the, when the board kicks around a proposed zoning change and we go through all the ins and outs of it and everything seems to be hunky-dory, and then we have a public hearing and folks come with very interesting perspectives on it that really change Holy cow, I never thought of that because I, I didn't live there. I didn't see it from that perspective. So um. so just to pick up on something George is saying, if, if um, you know, if we sort of move into this new model, like, you know, where it's staff administrative site plan, would that, would that have to have its own hearing? Like, or is it something that we would recommend to, what is the actual, can you just reiterate, like well, mechanically, like how would it, yeah. who waves the magic wand and says like, you know, or would there be a chance to say like, hey, we want to do this and here's why and we're going to talk about infill and this is much better for everybody if you guys can just do this. Like, yeah, what does that look like? Well, I think it would be very, um, I think, um, I think it would be um, spelled out and straight, I would hope it would be straightforward in that, um, the um, their, their, the process would just be either staff approval or not. Um, I think, and the notice is really just sort of as a bridge, I think, between where we have been with special permit and these detached right. units. Right. Um, I think I mean more like if, if that happens, like is there a chance for us to say like publicly, like citywide, hey, there's going to be this change. Heads uh, up, everybody. Yeah. Here's why. Oh, you this isn't coming out of nowhere. Right. Ordinance. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, it would have to go through the same public hearing process okay. that um, any zoning <coughs> ordinances. So, we are having this big um, PV right. um, public hearing uh, for the solar, um, ground mounted solar panels jointly with a Legislative Matters Committee. Okay. The same thing could happen. We might try to get the press involved in, I mean, I haven't done any outreach yeah. for this um, solar um, change, which by some people I think could be considered a big change. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know what people will feel is important and what's not important. Um, but yes, there's a okay. public hearing process. So there would be like a... Yep. And, and potentially two public hearings it. if you didn't do a joint public hearing gotcha. with the um, city council. Okay. But it would be a planning board hearing. And and yes, yeah, so in meetings ahead of that, you could you know, publicly announce it on TV and say, hey, you're <laughs> the upcoming attraction. Yeah. One reason we don't want to match the setbacks is what we're talking about for detached accessory apartments is you could tear down your house and rebuild it exactly the same setback with, you know, without going through any approvals at the same setback. So we're not getting, it won't be any closer to a neighbor than someone could do by expanding their house. Um, but I think the, the point about changing the language or trying to modify that discussion 
um, is important because we really need to, you know, Wayne was saying we need to figure out where, what we're going to be when we grow up. I don't know that we're ever going to grow up. It's sort of a new chapter on where do we need to redirect mm -hmm. and define because of these important issues, we need to be providing housing mm -hmm. for a whole range of people at different right. incomes, at different needs. We also need to, um, you know, support downtown commercial development. And so all, all of those things that are in our um, metrics that we try to measure in terms of being a sustainable community means that things are going to change and, and we've changed in population. So how do we offset those, you know, demographic shifts um, in a way that um, builds on our history, but also means things are going to look differently on the ground. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, when it comes to this too, the big pattern that's happening is just the aging of our community. Right. So younger people with their parents moving in and they want to have them live nearby, you know, right. so accessory structures become right and we don't want to farm them out into yeah. right, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> so what are our next steps in terms of is this something that You're gonna build it, so. we should discuss and make a recommendation tonight to you or is it something well we I just, just started working on the language so probably yeah. it may be more productive <coughs> for you to um, so this is the preview it sounds like you guys yeah. are um, an interested in maybe yeah. looking at mm -hmm. um, that as a change yeah. so mm -hmm. I can um, proceed on that path and provide some um, proposed language to look at at another meeting mm -hmm. and then we can weigh in on that what would really help me when we discuss that is a couple of live examples of what an accessory right. mm -hmm. dwelling looks like sure. in a neighborhood yeah, and, and even yeah. some of the ones of the attached uh, accessories so that you don't know, even see now that we yeah. don't see now right. but at one time were and I know where a couple of those are so I could mm -hmm. take some photos of it just so we had a good idea of that because okay. mm -hmm. I struggle with explaining to some of my friends exactly what infill is and where it really benefits us and where sometimes yeah it is kind of very rough on a neighborhood but right. you know. okay all right Um, so the next thing we've been talking about are map changes and I know over the last um, I think I pulled this up maybe originally two or three years ago we talked about urban residential a map changes meaning rezoning the areas of a that um, don't um, necessarily make sense and we looked at the entire city um, and um, talked about where some things maybe shift to suburban residential, some things sh shift to commercial, others just go to this, what the surrounding district is. And this actually came on the heels of Sustainable Northampton back 11 years ago, 10 years ago, when there was a lot of discussion about, yes, we feel like we need to change our development patterns and we want to be able to build more units closer to town, but don't forget to cover all the neighborhoods and not just focus on the B and C districts, but also include changes to A. Um, and we haven't gotten there yet. So with a deep breath, <laughs> I feel like, you know, even in the face of some of this pushback on projects that you all have seen, it's really important to sort of revisit that and say, some of these districts really don't make sense because there's URA, again, means only single family homes. And so um, you can do an accessory apartment, but you can't do a two or a three family. You can't do any kind of uh, multifamily. So um, the next slide I'll show you is the bigger picture, but what we were, are thinking is there are a couple of bites that we think are um, we want to start on. So instead of trying to tackle the whole URA map at once, mm -hmm. let's take, because the, this will need community outreach and we'll have to sit down with the neighborhoods and have public meetings just on that, I think, before we go through the zoning changes. So if we take chunks of this at a time as opposed to the whole city, um, we might be able to make some headway. Um, and so um, the on the right side, the colors, I'm sorry, they don't show up so well, um, but the URA, this, this is an area on the Round Hill Road um, on the back side of Clark School, uh, former Clark School, I guess. Um, there are two strips of urban residential A, and they go up um, Bancroft mm -hmm. and around, wrap around to Round Hill. Um, and the other one is Langworthy. 
and the entire neighborhood to the west is urban residential B, mm -hmm. the entire neighborhood to the east is urban residential C, mm -hmm. except for these two little strips. So um, there are, in some cases, there are some two families. I think Langworthy is all single family, but these are um, lots that are very similar to everything around it. Right. Mm -hmm. You just aren't allowed to do more than one unit on the property, yeah. and it's, and it's very, very close, close to downtown. Yeah. Um, in some cases, there, there are a couple of through lots, actually, that go from Bancroft to Hillside, sure. and um, so you could potentially carve off a, another building lot because there's only one house on it. So it's, it provides an opportunity for a modest amount of potential housing. Didn't we do some of those changes about 15 years ago in that neighborhood? From URB, or did there we was propose an that there was an attempt? So yeah. it was yes. proposed, well, and there were changes. The minimum lot size for URA shrunk, uh -huh. so that part happened, but there was no map change. But before that, okay. you're right. So Ward yeah. Avenue was included in that because that's mm -hmm. another chunk that's URA surrounded by B and yep. C. And there was a lot of pushback, and there was a lot of mm -hmm. pushback. Um, so, Caroline, can you just describe what the difference between B and C is? Yeah, so C is the <coughs> most dense residential district, and it surrounds downtown Northampton. And that's pretty much, there's another piece up there in the left corner, which I'll talk about. But primarily, it's around downtown. And, and you could have, the heights are 50 feet. You can have multifamily um, of any number of units, so long as you meet the minimum lot size requirement. Mm -hmm. In B, it's primar primarily single two and three families. Mm -hmm. You could have more units if you had a bigger parcel, and it's more, um, uh, it's less focused on multifamily, you know, stacked this way, and more about sort of single family form, like townhouse development mm -hmm. side by side, as opposed to mm -hmm. um, stacked units. So it's a little bit less dense. Um, there's less density allowed in the B district. Okay. And B goes sort of from that C core west of downtown and then surrounds Florence Center basically and then um, there and then out South Street is, mm -hmm. is B. Okay. M uh, much of the built area within Northampton core is B district I would say. Mm -hmm. So those two map changes on the right um, for that Round Hill neighborhood, um, we would recommend sort of starting the process on. The other map change is um, on Bridge Road. Hmm. So up on the corner, you see where it says HB? That is the Big Y Shopping Plaza. So it's hmm. basically this neighborhood that's sandwiched between Cook Avenue and Bridge Road oh. is zoned huh. now suburban residential and rural residential uh, even huh. though it's so close to those commercial districts and on the other side of bridge road is all b urban residential b um, it also goes up cook avenue and there's a if you see the urc bubble there's a um apartment complex across yeah. on that back side yeah. you know across yeah. behind mm -hmm. walmart that's urban residential c it's the only that i think they're three pockets of URC outside of downtown Northampton, and that's one of them. Um, and just because it's so high density, you know, that concentration of apartments. So the idea here is to pull that in to URB. Mm -hmm. The lots are really not that large anyway. Um, they're primarily built out, but there is some opportunity for other um, housing um, development potentially, and it's, really walkable on that back side to the commercial district. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then the bike path isn't too right. far on the other side of Bridge Road. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Lathrop um, community is already <coughs> URB there on the far left, which is the other label that says URB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is sort of sandwiched in as sort of that odd um, RRSR pocket. So that's another. Um, and then uh, that's all Fitzgerald Lake kind of Conservation area behind it to the right. So that yeah. would stay. Um, well, now it's zoned um, conservation, which is farms, forests, and rivers. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some RR to, that is not part of Fitzgerald Lake. That's a little bit south of that on the north side of Bridge Road, like where the cemetery is in um, that area. 
Um, so those are. Has that ever come up before? Like, <laughs> yes, for a long time. <laughs> so um, there was a property owner he recently passed away who lives right on Bridge Road. And he, for years and years, was filling his property because he wanted to build, create new lots. And he petitioned the city to change his land to mm -hmm. URB. And we said, you know, it didn't make sense, just his property. We need right. to look at the bigger picture. Right. We also have talked at various times about waiting for traffic um, modifications and patterns to be, or, or the traffic um, control situation on Bridge Road to be redesigned because mm -hmm. of that tough intersection with Hatfield right. before any zoning changes. But we don't know how long to wait for that. We don't know that it makes sense to <laughs> wait forever for that. So that's the extent of that. Yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. And he will roll over when it happens. No kidding, I know. <laughs> <So> sad. <laughs> yeah. So next slide, please. You never assaulted you, did you, Wade? Yeah. <laughs> he mellowed in his years. Yeah. Um, so us moving beyond those sort of things that are right on our table that we'd like to see <coughs> pushing now are um, future URA map changes, sort mm -hmm. of after we get that first chunk. And the map on the right is shows that the bright fuchsia are the URA pockets. Mm -hmm. So um, the big triangle shaped um, area on the east side of that map is um, includes Child's Park, which we talked about previously about going to farms, forests, and rivers, because that's mm -hmm. never going to be developed anyway. So take that out of URA. Mm -hmm. But then the surrounding neighborhoods on off of Prospect Street, sort of north a little bit up to the bike path, they're all surrounded by B, but that district is A, and also Woodlawn mm -hmm. is A. So mm -hmm. that's what that triangle is. And then the little um, squiggly one just south of that is the Ward Avenue neighborhood. that. Yeah, right. um, um, and it's really just the tip of that <laughs> neighborhood. Mm. Um, so would you guys recommend changing that or leaving it as is? No, oh, changing it, but yeah. doing it one <coughs> piece at a time. Mm -hmm. well, one reason Ward Avenue is sort of lower priority is symbolically we should do it. It's, it's next to URB, the neighborhood's next door, our URB. Practically, given the geography and given it, the homes being built out, I, I'm not sure we're going to spend a lot of time because I don't think you can get a single housing unit. Right. At least right. in my lifetime, yeah. happening there. So, but you know, we should. It, does, it doesn't make sense, so why not? Mm -hmm. And then moving towards Florence, the um, next district west is really north of. So that Strawberry Hill uh, Fox Farms neighborhood, which is sandwiched between just north of Florence Center and then up to Bridge Road, mm -hmm. is a. It's not significantly different in lots area, but it just it was created when in the 60s or 70s, and it was you know did, URA. Did that get reduced the last time around? That that area did it get smaller, or did it? Did we make an effort and we got a lot of pushback and it stayed. Uh, we never really went. I don't think we were trying to do that one yet. Uh, so I remember talking about that. We, I mean, so obviously with the URA changes, the lot size and the frontage was adjusted just a few, you know, in 2013, but not the actual map change. So that hasn't changed at all okay. over time. And then you move into Leeds, um, um, and actually there's a big chunk that's Look Park that would go to Farms, Forest, and River. Mm -hmm. But then there's um, Leeds, and, um, and again, there may be some opportunities for one or two units here and there, probably not a lot, but it, again, it's sort of, it, it's, I'm not sure that it makes sense, although there was a lot of discussion on the planning board about maybe just leaving that for the time being. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, that's, we can handle that when we get to it and, and have deeper conversation about whether, what makes sense for leads. And then there's an area, I think that's Chesterfield Road, that's URA that maybe makes sense to go to something less dense off of Chesterfield Road. Mm -hmm. So that's the map changes for URA. The other changes we've talked about and we've given you, uh, um, you know, um, some briefing on is um, form-based code. Before we go there, I, I just wanted to check in to make sure we don't have to open that other hearing at 7:30. Is there any bureaucratic? Ten of eight. 
Um, hearings, you can, we can stop play. and or it, we can do it later. Can, yeah, you can do it later. Okay. I don't. Did anybody come in for that? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, so are you all here for the seven thirty hearing? No. Okay. <laughs> so You're just here to hear this conversation <laughs> about planning and good. Yeah, we're um, we're graduate students and we're like starting to learn planning. We're studying um, landscape design. And we're working with a planning board in Abington. Um, and so we're trying to learn a little bit about form based code and kind of see what we can glean from the conversation. Zoning issues in general. It's on the agenda. So we go. Yeah. Great. Sorry, we don't have more hearings on our agenda today. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually more interesting. So we've started the conversation about <coughs> form based code for downtown Florence and downtown Northampton. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're, we actually have a meeting next week with the consultants to sort of as a follow-up to the public meetings that were held back in October. Um, so we'll know a bit more about where we are in that process um, after next week. And then potentially think about if there's a way to extrapolate a type of form-based code for residential districts. We don't know yet, but we mentioned that previously. Just before you do that, so I mentioned this briefly in the last meeting, but as we talk about form-based code for downtown in Florence, we chose those areas in some ways because it's not going to be difficult. It's not that different from what we're doing. But I think we definitely want to do more form-based code elsewhere in town. And I think one of the, the priority settings for you all is after we do Florence and downtown, do we keep doing commercial industrial areas? Because basically it's easy and it's a better code. And it's easy. <laughs> or due to the neighborhoods, which it could be an excruciating process because everybody's nervous, but it could address exactly what George said, it gives people more comfort level of what the design will be. Mm -hmm. um, and so you don't decide now, but just keep that in the back of your mind of what are, what's next after Florence and downtown. Um, <coughs> and then the other thing we've kicked around, you know, no, we're not necessarily pushing one way or the other, but things that we're thinking about are how do we create um, incentives for creating buildings that are net zero. You know, how can we just push um, in that direction further? We know we've gotten the stats back for our evaluation for the community, and certainly with commercial buildings, that's a huge chunk of our um, our consumption and greenhouse um, gas <coughs> impact. So, um, you know, what is it that we could do? Um, legally from a land use perspective to affect building uh, changes to the energy standards for buildings. So, um, you know, is that something that we add to any special permit standard for the B and C districts when larger developments come forward or, or something like that? So, um, you know, do are there either um, permit incentives to do that or, um, I don't know, if density incentives make sense, but mostly maybe just um, streamlining, streamlining the permitting may be a way to do that. So those are sort of some of the other things we're thinking about. And then the only other sh um, thing I wanted to talk about is um, our other changes that are coming down um, in front of you soon, that they've already either been introduced to council or and will come back to you for public hearing. Um, <coughs> or are about to be introduced to City Council. Um, and those are the lighting standards, which, yeah. um, you know, I had started working on a couple of years ago, and we just, um, it just got pushed to the back burner. But we really do need to address, and you've seen it in, your, in the permits that you're reviewing, um, <coughs> not only are more standard and more of these lights available, LED lights and systems, but we have also seen the negative impacts of LED just because they're efficient doesn't mean they put off good light or they're designed well to not to have offsite impacts. So um, um, we're, we have a draft. I'm working with the building commissioner to sort of look at <coughs> better nice. technical experience and understanding of this stuff than I do. And then I think there's going to be a lot of community conversation about that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but that sh really will be coming in the next couple of months, probably, for you guys as sort of on a parallel track. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we have the public hearing February 11th for the change to the um, large-scale 
um, ground-mounted solar systems um, and as it relates to the amount of tree clearing allowed for that. Uh, and then the other sort of side project is not zoning, but um, you'll hear about it is um, try to get a handle on creating regulations for um, shared mobility devices like scooters and bikes that are. Um, is that a lot of What's that? We just yeah. <laughs> no scooters. Right. <laughs> Stop with the scooters. <laughs> So um, that goes, that'll be just city council because it's not a part of zoning. It's, it's actually gonna be introduced in the, um, more of the infrastructure section of the, and the DPW side of the, um, of the code. Um, but it'll be important for you to. Not like on the law enforcement side of the code um, around vehicular traffic or that's not where it would come from. Well, no, so it's partially that. So there's a whole series of code that addresses um, how you can use the street and the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of will be wrapped into that because we don't have any bikes, um, bike parking standards, actually, like where you're allowed to park bicycles, yeah. where you're not allowed to park bicycles. So this will introduce that, not just for bike share type of facilities, but for anybody right. on any bike or any do you have like news box standards? <laughs> or is that? That's a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> a little wrinkle, but yeah. yeah. We deal with that. Our plan is to get rid of all the private news boxes downtown and replace them with sort of the newspaper condos that you see. Uh -huh. that Smith College did a John and Green, that's the only way up here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can have sort of, you know, good, you know, more attractive more boxes. Attractive, mm -hmm. right. Fewer of them. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it made me think of the sidewalk yeah. and that yeah. right. yeah. stuff that happened. That's a good question. Right. So, um, so that will address not only sort of everybody, anybody who wants to park a bicycle, sort of what, where you're supposed to park them and where you're supposed to keep the sidewalk clear of any of these, um, but also create a permit system for companies that want to create private bike share or scooter uh -huh. or anything else. Denied. <laughs> but we are taught, I mean, the way that it's being introduced is that we don't want to allow private companies to be able to locate in downtown Northampton mm -hmm. because we already have, you know, we spend an enormous right. amount of time and money to establish Valley Bike. So uh, we want to make sure that, you know, has a fair chance of being successful. So. <clears throat> That's um, so that's that will be coming, but again, it's not zoning, so y you won't be involved in the public hearing. You can certainly participate in the conversation. Right. Um, change to the lighting standards. So, you recently developed tree planting standards that were accepted, similar to this. Is are there new tr planting standards that have become codified? So, there's a tree planting guide that uh -huh. has been adopted, in the, and I don't know the technical or mechanical way that it was adopted, but the mayor has officially identified it as sort of the city's tree planting guide. We use it, uh, we reference it in the co sort of subdivision standards and then in landscape standards yep. um, okay. for the zoning for site plan, it references that tree planting guide. But it's not as legislated as the lighting standards. Right. <coughs> <laughs> it's great. It's exciting yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's terrific. Would pedal pubs fall under shared mobility? Yeah, <laughs> 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 that's a, so funny. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's so popular. Yeah. In, good, in better weather climate. Yeah. Better yeah. weather cities. But, yeah. What's the premise, though? You get on a. You bring your own alcohol and you get on this thing and they. You just tool around town, you tool around your, town. Yeah. with your friends and right. Just you're like an right. oddity. See and be seen. Have your own feeds. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's just a party vehicle. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And they yeah. said on the Manhattan Trail it won't be an issue, even though it's yay wide, that they'll pull over to the side and let the bikes go by easily. And You'd have to pull over every 30 seconds, it would seem. <laughs> it right. seems so. But so you'll keep us posted. We're in agreement, it seems like, and moving forward on all the things you discussed. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Shall we open up our 730 <laughs> public hearing? <laughs> And when you look in that crystal ball, are there a lot of big permitting applications coming up before us during the spring, February, March, and April, or? Not so far. I mean, no. people are talking. There's, well, there's one project that may form, but um, nothing so beyond like that. Time yeah. That so yeah. when you look in your... 10-year crystal ball. Are there any <laughs> URA areas left in the city? <laughs> well, that's, yeah, gone? I'm wondering, like, do we just eliminate at some point? Right. Is that just no longer even part of our zoning? Um, that may be, yeah. Um, I don't, I think it's hard to explain a lot of those areas that are URA. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it probably makes sense to, and you know, we tried, do you remember we tried to change the name? So we yeah. name yeah. what it meant and um that was a hard thing to <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the ura is only single family right yeah. right okay. carolyn what's the best way for me to get the zoning book so to speak in hard copy to download it and three hole punch it myself i mean we don't have right. an right. inventory of those right right you know you right know, you can print two two movie. sheets per page double-sided double-sided that's my yeah. <laughs> two yeah. sheets per page and double-sided and then you get four oh, pages per sheet of paper still okay that you can i mean for now but i'm yeah. you know okay. only in my early because i can see yeah. this, this kind of conversation yeah. it might yeah. be very very handy to have right. it yeah. in front of me once in a while so i can look at yeah. right well i mean to that point on the lighting i started creating a red line version and there's so many dramatic changes that i just had to cle create yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> if you want to go look at the old one yeah that makes um, sense well if everyone is okay with everything we discussed yeah we'll move on to our 7 30 hearing for um withdrawal of a special permit for 236 south street um, I don't have the map ID in front of me. Um, sorry. I don't have a so we have to make a formal approval to accept the withdrawal. Right. Um, and you should determine whether you want to do it with prejudice or without. Um, which, so if you did it with prejudice, they couldn't come back within two years unless the plan substantially changed um, from what it was. Mm -hmm. um, if you do it without prejudice, then they can turn around. I'm not sure that, you know, I, I guess I would probably recommend with prejudice because you didn't, it didn't seem like it was. That's pretty much where we left off anyway. Where we needed a substantial change, and I imagine that's right. most of the reason why they withdrew. Right, right, right. But if he decided that he wanted to not make as much money, if that's what it came down to, and we say with prejudice, then he can't come back for two for years. Two years. No, with unless he substantially changes the plan. Right. The plan is whatever he legitimately filed that last version right. with the plan. Right. 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 So, so it has to be different. But what would the not. what's the downside without prejudice? What could happen that would? I mean, it would just you downside. Would see it again, right? The same way. Okay. Why would he do that though? It costs him so much money. Yeah, right. Right. If he knows it's we're not, not logical. Going to right. It's Next. not. I'm yeah. just uh, yeah, laying right. out the. <laughs> right. Yeah. And he can't form. So we have to be here to do this because you can't formally withdraw. Is that you have to vote. Accept. You have to accept the withdrawal. 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 You have to withdraw. Because it was all, you know, you were in the middle of a public hearing. Mm. And so the decision, a decision has to be issued saying that the board accepted withdrawal. Because otherwise, you've already it's part way through the process. Out Otherwise, there. there's no end point. Hmm. Then we've ghosted. Closure. Right. Get it. Yeah. <laughs> I thought him walking out of here. He yeah. said right, he's done right. closure, yeah. but I guess not. Yeah. All right. So, so I would we have move, a motion. Uh, make a motion to approve the withdrawal of the uh, content, uh, the special permit of the site plan by Benjamin Lewis for 12 new units at 236 South Street. Uh, there's no map ID, so I'm not sure with the appropriate map ID, and I'd say without prejudice. Is there a second? I'll second that. I would say without. Do we want to have any discussion? So just a quick question. We already closed the public hearing. We closed the public hearing, and this is a Oh, actually, no. you, you need to close.
close and accept the withdrawal. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. yeah. So maybe. So moved. Okay. We can do that all in one yeah. motion. Mm -hmm. Do we have discussion? Or? So basically, if we felt like he would come back with the same plan, then we might want to do it with prejudice. But since that seems highly unlikely, there's no reason right. to. Since we rejected right. the last plan, it would. Right. It wouldn't make sense for him to do that. But if he chose to do that, we'd end up rejecting it again. So, right. so all we risk is just more of our time, basically. Right. <laughs> Listening to it all over again. Yeah. Okay. I promise I wouldn't let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Unanimous. Okay. We have an ANR. One ANR. So this is for the. Um, Former Willard on um, Burstcut Road, where the uh, solar installation and just grow. healthy marijuana production. Yep. So it's actually um, carving up the parcels into those two different um, entities, or for the purposes of those two different entities to purchase, but also creating the um, 20, almost 26 acre parcel for city open space. So it's all in one, um, this ANR. And you remember the solar array doesn't need frontage, so mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. off to the side with no frontage, but access on that shared road coming in from Ryan Road. Okay. Is there a motion to endorse? So moved. Second? Jana? All those in favor? My kids were home for the holidays and I went to walk the dog and I forgot all about that my brother lives on cardinal way yeah. and so we park and i'll walk the dog so the three of us and i said oh there's a great path you can go around and we got you know 50 yards into it and then it was all clear cut. Cut. yeah it was just it was Huge. and then i was like oh that's right this <laughs> is and you could see the tr the houses that used to have a nice buffer of forest between them and the pit and now that buffer's gone hmm that's it. That's it. Any final motion? I'll move to adjourn the meeting <laughs> of the planning board. <laughs> Any second? Jana? All those in favor? No discussion? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>